I'll start with, with uh, Catherine Mannix, uh, author of um, uh, With the End in Mind, Dying a Death and Wisdom in an Age of Denial. Uh, starting in cancer care, she changed career to become a pioneer in what was then the new discipline of uh, palliative medicine and has worked in hospices, hospitals and in patients' own homes to deliver palliative care to optimize quality of life even while death is approaching. She believes that better public awareness about what happens to us as we die will reduce fear and enable people to discuss their hopes and plans with the people who matter to them. So with that, uh, I, uh, I give you uh, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Great turnout to talk about dying. Excellent. Obviously, the pubs are closed. What can I say? I've spent a lifetime working at the bedsides of dying people. And for my palliative care colleagues who I see amongst us, I will start with the, um, the advert and disclaimer that palliative care, of course, is not about dying. It's about living, it's about quality of life, and it's about symptom management. But it so happens that a lot of the people that we're looking after are reaching the ends of their lives. And so we become very experienced in matters of dying also. During COVID, I think that two interesting things have, very, uh, have happened alongside each other. One is that the uh, public reluctance to talk about dying has been faced down by the actual fact that death was walking amongst us so much more commonly. And so people have begun to have conversations about preferences and wishes and values and what kind of treatment they would like or not like to have that I really welcome. I think that's an absolutely fantastic development. But of course, only a few people have started to have those conversations. And many, many other people have not had those conversations and yet have found themselves sick during the time of COVID and now having to make very difficult decisions in a pressure bubble. So my campaigning, which started, well, four years ago when I retired or 20 years ago when I realised that we still aren't talking about dying, depending on how you look at it, my campaigning is about getting us all to think about the fact that we're mortal and the fact that we will one day die. And the better prepared we are for that, the easier it will be for us when decisions about treatment have to be made or when decisions about place of care need to be made. And also the easier it will be for the people whom we love. And I'm probably going to use the word family a lot during this discussion, but I mean the family of choice around us. And that may not be people to whom we're uh, related by blood or marital ties. I think it takes a village to raise a child and it also takes a village to enable somebody to live the last part of their life very, very well. So those are the people I'm talking about, our beloveds. There's been a lot in the media during COVID about something that the media is choosing to call advanced care planning or ACP. Um, and what they're actually talking about are decisions about cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, decisions about whether or not to accept ventilation by having a tube put down your trachea and being connected to a mechanical ventilator. And they are very important treatment medical decisions that may need to be made for some people who are very sick. But advanced care planning is so much richer than that. Advanced care planning is actually looking forward towards our future with hope. It's about thinking about what our values are. It's about thinking about what our preferences would be, about the balance between striving to live as long as might be possible, regardless of the intrusiveness of the treatments that might be required to achieve a few extra weeks or days of life, or other people deciding that actually it's the quality of my living that is the most important thing to me and I don't want to have intrusive treatments. And that isn't a once and for all decision. I meet people who have decided that actually 
my length of life isn't important to me. It's how well I can live. It's how uh, much I'm able to be in charge of what happens to me, how, I, how I'm able to be independent. Who then find that something catastrophic happens to them, that their prediction was they would never tolerate something like that. And they find themselves tolerating it and they are amazed. So it's very, very hard for us to know how we'll respond to future medical calamity. But the other thing that happens is that the rest of our lives goes on happening. So somebody who's decided that actually, I'm not gonna have any more treatment, doctor. I want you to help me to not have symptoms of my illness, but I'm not going to have my kidney dialysis anymore. It started off helping me to live. And now 30 years later, it's simply slowing down my dying. And that's quite a legitimate decision to make. And then they find out that actually there's a grandchild due to be born. And suddenly now living for those extra months becomes much more important because it's a particular and special goal. So advanced care planning is a process. It's not an event. It's a series of conversations. It's mainly not conversations with our doctors. It's mainly conversations with our beloveds. And it's conversations with people whom we trust to give us advice about our rights, about our medical treatment, about our spiritual direction, in order to be able to reach a set of preferences and values that may include some decisions about intubation, ventilation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, things we can talk about later in this conversation if you wish. But it's much more about living than it is about dying. It's about celebrating life and looking forward in hope. Thank you so much, Catherine. So if people can hold some of that in 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 their heads, and 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 do feel free to 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 put down uh, comments even for your own uh, memory, because we'll have a couple of more uh, speakers uh, before we have to uh, a general discussion. So our uh, second speaker is is Liz Toy, who is a, a cons consultant clinical oncologist based at the Royal Devon and Exeter Foundation uh, NHS Trust, where until recently she was clinical director for cancer and end of life care. She's now the national clinical lead uh, for uh, GERFT, I think I'll pronounce it like that, uh, Get It Right First Time, um, a lung cancer work stream. Her primary clinical interests are in patients with uh, lung and upper gastrointestinal cancers, Following oncology training in Wales and Vancouver, she was appointed uh, to Exeter Oncology Centre in 2001. Currently, she serves on the National Lung Expert Reference Group. Uh, she was a member of the NICE Care of the Dying Audit Guideline Group and contributed to the Art of Dying Well project. So, uh, uh, over to you, Liz. Lovely. Thank you for um, that introduction, David. Um, can you all hear me? So that is a yes. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit um, in the patient journey. And um, obviously, when patients are diagnosed with cancer, that brings up a number of questions regarding dying. And some of you may have seen last week's Panorama programme entitled Britain's Cancer Care Crisis, presented by Deborah James. And in the programme, she presented some very sad personal stories of patients who felt their prognoses had been directly affected by the COVID pandemic. The stories included those who felt there'd been a delay in investigation and those for whom treatment had been put on pause. And whilst I wouldn't want to comment on any individual patient stories, I'd like to outline some of the reasons behind these issues and share some of the incredible work being performed by clinicians and commissioners to try to mitigate these circumstances. And whilst as an oncologist, I would limit my initial remarks to cancer, Similar initiatives are very much ongoing for non-malignant but equally life-threatening conditions. One of the major concerns is about late diagnosis. And we know that if a cancer is caught at an early stage, the chance of cure is significantly higher. Sadly, many cancers come to medical attention when cure is not possible and treatment focuses on improving quality and length of life. We recognise that cancer will shorten people's lives. Being given a terminal diagnosis will obviously be devastating to a patient and their families. 
And when there's been a delay in diagnosis, that's often exacerbated by anger at the medical system. And maybe in some cases, guilt that advice should have been sought at an earlier time point. So why are we seeing so much late diagnosis? Well, firstly, a number of patients delayed seeking help themselves due to fears of contracting COVID-19. We know, and I've listened to a number of GP messages, that the message may well have dissuaded people from utilising face-to-face services. We know that clinical teams tried very hard not to admit people to hospital because of fear of them contracting COVID-19, which presented the instant access to tests which might otherwise have been available. And even when people were referred in some parts of the country, there were delays in obtaining scans as the scanners themselves were being used to screen COVID patients waiting for surgery or in the management of patients with existing COVID disease. We also know that tests that we rely on so much that gener generate aerosols such as endoscopy or bronchoscopy stopped almost overnight in view of the risks to both patients and clinical staff. And the capacity in order to deliver operations and tests fell because of the way that we needed to change the air so um, in any rooms that the procedures were being done in. So even now this has restarted, those delays remain. We really saw a dramatic decrease in the number of new patients, but now we're beginning to see a surge in referrals. The other area we've seen a big increase in is the patients with known cancer presenting with new problems at a much later point than they would have done previously. And that's fear of both the virus and the isolation that comes within, with coming into a cancer ward without the benefit of your, your family, as Catherine describes, around you. An example of this might include, for instance, a patient known to have cancer affecting their spine, putting up with pain and only seeking advice when they've lost the power in their legs and their spinal cord has become damaged. And that loss of mobility gives an extremely poor prognosis and the chance of returning to independent life would be very small. With regard to access to treatments, Initially, there was a very rapid response by both NHS England and clinical bodies. NICE issued guidance which offered advice on things like switching to video and telephone consultations. But some recommendations, for instance, when suggesting patients came unaccompanied to clinic, have almost certainly been negative in terms of patient experience and also understanding of what's going on with them and what's likely to happen in the future. Many treatments other than surgery, did continue, often almost as normal. And many patients were offered alternative treatments, for instance, radiotherapy rather than surgery for the lung cancer. And indeed, even patients who had COVID-19 often continued on radiotherapy treatment, for instance, if they were fit enough, as we know that gaps in treatment can be detrimental. But departments had to adjust schedules to enable other patients to remain safe and minimise risk for staff. Within those guidelines, there was advice regarding which patients' treatment should be deprioritised in the event of service capacity problems. For instance, we often deferred the start of radiotherapy for a patient with prostate cancer who was on established hormone treatment controlling their, their illness. But for chemotherapy, there was a similar list prioritising patients who had most to gain from, chemo from treatment, but with the suggestion that when the chance of a response was low, or the average extension of life less than a year, that these patients would not be offered treatment if there was incapacity, insufficient capacity within the service. And for that individual and their family, this lack of access can be very difficult, impossible to accept. So at the same time, professional groups were working together to lead guideline writing to provide an evidence base for the proposed treatment changes in standard practice. So for instance, um, we've written guidelines about using less radiotherapy visits for lung or breast cancer, or increasing the scheduling interval of some immunotherapy treatments. So good for patients not having to come so often, and also helping increase overall access to patients. Hospitals have collaborated to enable recovery plans, particularly with regard to diagnostics and surgery, with um, having the idea of having clean hospitals and other hospitals where patients with COVID will be concentrated. 
But the greatest change in my view has been the content of the medical consultations. We've needed to discuss risk and benefit of continuing treatment with individual patients whilst dealing with significant uncertainty. And these risks included the reported instance of the ch increased chance of dying of COVID-19 if a patient contracted this and made worse, particularly if they were on anti-cancer treatments. So we did have some helpful guidance from um, colleagues at Imperial who collated the experience in countries coming in from China and Italy and modelled the impact on our patients to guide us. And also our international colleagues have been sharing their experiences on Zoom. But what we found was many patients wanted to pause or delay treatment because of the very real fears regarding coronavirus, where often the medical advice might have been to continue. Many good things have come from this enforced change. So we can post chemotherapy to outpatients, we can give patients more control by self-administering some of their treatments, and we've gained access to previously unfunded treatments with lower toxicity. But the sad reality for many patients with cancer is at some point, even if they're on treatment now or had treatment, the cancer will return or further treatments might not be possible. Whether that's now or in the years to come will vary. And I think it will be at that stage when in approaching their dying, many questions will be asked as to whether the position would have been different if standard of care treatments had been used or the cancer caught earlier. So for the vast majority of patients, I don't believe the situation would actually be any different. And in some cases, they may even have gained some benefit in terms of quality of life. But even when communication has been good and decision-making very much shared between the clinical team, the patient and their family, undoubtedly patients and families will question and find the situation harder to accept and grieving more difficult when that time comes. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. More, much more again to think about. Um, uh, and uh, last and not least, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Father Giles Pinnock, who is lead chaplain of the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, where he served as Roman Catholic chaplain for seven years and as lead chaplain for the last two years. Uh, he is a convert to Catholicism and his father was an Anglican hospital chaplain in London, South Africa and in the United States. He's currently working slowly and with many interruptions, he says, uh, on an MA in bioethics at St. Mary's University in Twickenham. Uh, so, Father Giles, you're very welcome. Thank you, David, thank you. Um, when I was thinking about what I was gonna say in these um, few minutes at the beginning of the session, the question that came back to me several times was, given that so much of my work is around the circumstances and the feelings people have around the time of their dying. What is different about dying in the time of a pandemic? What makes this time different? What has made people use phrases like unprecedented times? What has made people um, stop and take, a, and take a step back? What has been so different? And I think in many ways to jump straight to a conclusion, one of the things about COVID has been that it is for many of us an offense against our culture. Our culture has imagined itself um, in recent decades and perhaps even back to the time of um, the discovery of penicillin, which happened in um, a small room, not, not, not many yards from where I'm sat now. Um, We've increasingly thought of ourselves as, through medicine, through science, largely omnipotent. We can crack most things. Um, there are adverts on the telly about cancer that we will, we will beat cancer, we will beat this, we will beat that. And suddenly we had presented to us through our TV screens and through those horrific images from Italy in particular, a situation that our science and our medicine couldn't control. And I think a lot of people found that culturally offensive and that's what made people take a step back and has in many ways culturally put us like rabbits in the headlights of a bus. 
and we've been and we've not known quite what to do and it has taken time for us to kind of recenter um, and certainly I think good things will come out of this experience we will learn and there'll be technical things we've learned like zooming and certainly one thing that certainly came out of my experience was an occasion when I had to give the last rites to a gentleman on an intensive care unit. His family couldn't be there. Um, I had to wear what amounted to a spacesuit, and I was on the ward for an hour and a half, probably dripping with sweat underneath all this PPE that I was wearing. But we were able to set up a computer by the side of the bed such that the screen and the camera were looking at the um, gentleman who was dying and his wife and his sister-in-law and brother-in-law were able to watch through Zoom and, and to join in the ritual, join in giving the last rites. But so also were his relatives in Goa and Newcastle and the United States. And that's something good that we've learned because it actually um, enabled more people to be present. So although the circumstance was horrific in many ways, that was something that we can learn, that we can use the technology in ways that we may not have thought about it. For a few weeks before, um, or months before all of this happened, this app kept popping up on my computer saying, we've installed Teams, and I kept uninstalling it, and thinking, what, what on earth is this wretched thing? Why does it keep coming up? And I, got, I kept getting rid of it. And now I realize its value, that and Zoom, enables people to connect. And that's another of the themes that I've spotted, I've noticed, I've observed in my practice as a hospital chaplain. And one of the things that isn't just offensive to our culture, but offensive to us as human beings, as spiritual beings, is that COVID and the way people are treated for COVID in hospital is alienating, it's isolating. It separates people from their loved ones, as, uh, as, as, Liz, as, as Liz and, uh, and Catherine have both mentioned. And you've probably all seen the clip of somebody saying quite early on in the COVID epidemic that the last time he saw his father was being put in the back of an ambulance and that was the last he ever saw. They hadn't at that point worked out about how to use iPads and iPhones and Zoom and things. People are isolated. But even when I was giving last rites to that gentleman on um, intensive care, and actually on many, many other occasions similarly, they were told by the nurse, they were told by me that the person stood in front of them was a priest, but they couldn't see that, they couldn't see this, they couldn't see me, they couldn't see my face, they could see my eyes. And that's quite alienating. There's something a bit sci-fi and a bit horror movie about it. It alienates people from the humane side of dying that actually I think in many ways we were beginning to get a little better at. And Catherine's book was fantastic and the number of people I know who've read that. And we all feel like we were learning from it. And suddenly in our practice in hospitals, we seem to have unlearned a lot of the humanity of how we were um, were with people who were dying, not because we wanted to be inhumane, but because we were separated by PPE and plastic face shields and, and all sorts of things. And the ability that however high, how, however high you raised your voice, perhaps you couldn't quite be heard because of all the muffling. I told my team of chaplains that I wanted them as much as possible to carry on as usual. I mean, no, that, that seemed unrealistic and we had to make adjustments. But as chaplains, as ministers of religion, of whichever religion it is, it's already part of what we do to help people prepare for their dying, to help people across that threshold, to accompany their loved ones. And we had far less opportunity in many ways to do that. Um, I know that in some hospitals, the chaplains were either told to stay away or opted to stay away, perhaps because of their chaplaincy team was made up of people with comorbidities and age and, and things. We tried very hard to stay alongside our medical, our nursing um, colleagues, wear the same PP as they did, um, 
and be with them and be with the, with the patients and try to overcome that isolation, that alienation from what was going on. The isolation and that almost more highly medicalized dying that seemed to be going on in this, in, in this very difficult time. Other things felt wrong. The fact that people couldn't have the religious rituals that they may have been used to. They, they, um, they couldn't have the, f the funerals that they might have expected. Um, funerals that only took place in the crematorium or at the grave with few or no mourners. Deprivation, de we were deprived in many ways. People were deprived of the moments of their grieving that are so important. Um, everything seemed to revolve around why they died and what they died of and not how they and not how they'd been accompanied as they died so there's a lot to learn and some of it's negative and some of it's po positive in some ways yes this experience has been unprecedented at least in recent memory but i think when you say unprecedented times you almost tell yourself we've got to forget about everything that went before and not carry forward the lessons of the past we need to we need to do it all different and I think actually in many ways dying of COVID is a death and we should be trying to serve a company, be with the people who are suffering that death just as we, just as with anybody else. And we shouldn't allow ourselves to be thrown too much back onto the back foot. But of course, it's been a very, very difficult experience for everybody. But I think one of the things we have to hold on to in, and, and return to is the fact that in things like the Dying World Project and with it and in Catherine's book, um, there's a very important pressure on us to make dying more humane. And I think that this time has challenged us in our ability to make dying more humane and more um, about the person who is dying in there. And, and as Catherine pointed out, the way that they are continuing to live up to the end and not just about the fact they're dying. My experience as a chaplain has been in some ways very rewarding to be with these people as they die, but also very challenging and very distressing on occasion when you could see you weren't able to do everything that perhaps we wanted to and that this pandemic is a, a very particular time, but a time from which to learn. Okay, thank you. So th thank you, thank you so much for that. We've had various uh, comments and questions are all, all already coming through. Uh, there's one which is quite a, a general one, but might be a nice focus, which I could ask each of you to answer from, um, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, uh, uh, Pia uh, Mitra. I wanted to know what does it mean uh, to say a good death, especially during the uh, time of pandemic. Okay, thank you. So what is a good death in a pandemic, Catherine? <laughs> thank you, Piali, fantastic question. And is a good death in a pandemic different from a good death at any other time, I wonder, that there is something about dying well physically, which is about comfort, which is about symptom management, but there's something about dying well, which is about our personhood, which is about who we are, who we see ourselves as. And the thing that I see in people who are coming to the end of their lives repeatedly is that they make a, a kind of um, spiritual reckoning and I use the word spiritual whether that's in a religious context or not that people think about what their life has been worth according to the values that they live by and it might be that these are Roman Catholic patients who are uh, trying to evaluate themselves against uh, how well they've lived a Christian life how well they've kept the rules of Catholicism. But it might be somebody who, who's wondering, 
how how much they've done to save the planet and live a green life or how faithful to the communist party they've been we all have a set of values that we use that we we make a reckoning by at the end of our lives and so it's really important that we're able to tell ourselves the story and see what we've done well and to see where we failed with the humility but without despair and part of dying well for most people but not for everybody is the companionship and the accompaniment at the last part of their living i think it's important though that we're able to discern that there are first of all some people who feel they wish to be alone on their deathbed that they wish to think and to reconcile themselves and they need quiet and space to do that and so not everybody who has died alone during this period of COVID, whether they've been dying of COVID or of something else, has died lonely whilst they've been dying alone. But some people very much relish the companionship and the company of their beloveds. And so once we got savvy about the technology, um, the hospital where I was working bought uh, iPads for every ward so that we could enable families to chat at the pillow at the bedside of a person. I've, I've been in contact with somebody who was living in Ireland whose mother was dying on the west coast of America. And the hospital set up a Zoom call for her where she simply was present in her mother's room by Zoom 24 hours a day, as she might be had they been in the same house, popping in and out, looking to see how she was, chatting when she was awake. So a good death during a pandemic might be the best that we can manage under difficult circumstances, mightn't it? And that are we attending to the person as a whole? Have we thought about them not just as a, a physical body that might be having symptoms of the illness of which they're dying, but have we thought about their emotional needs? Have we thought about their family, their beloveds, their village and their contact with those people? And have we been faithful companions for them as they make their spiritual reckoning? I muted myself. Um, uh, any comments, uh, uh, further comments, Liz? I think Catherine's given a very comprehensive um, reply. It just struck me as you were talking um, in terms of particularly about preparing oneself for death. Um, obviously, many of my own patients are, do have a terminal illness. And one of the things that has struck me about time in the pandemic that actually families have often had more time to be with their loved one, even if it's not physically there, but in contact on a more regular basis. They've really made more of special occasions and really valued that time. And actually somehow, because so much came to a sort of a stop with lockdown, I think there have been some great opportunities for families to have very meaningful discussions. So actually, when it comes to those last few days, many more of those conversations have gone on and there are many more good memories to, um, to think about. Now, clearly, that's a different situation to um, the acute death. But yet, even reflecting on some of the things that have happened in my own hospital, I think because people have been so heightened to the isolation in, in hospitals, I'm just thinking back to a, a phone call I got at eight o'clock one morning from an ED consultant of a patient I'd not actually met, but he'd been referred as a potential cancer. And this ED consultant was thinking about where it would be best to place the gentleman in the hospital. He wondered whether he should go to ITU because there was more visiting allowed on ITU. In the end, he actually came to an oncology ward. But rather than being admitted alongside the normal pathway, to an acute surgical unit or an acute medical unit. A lot of that thinking was going on at a very early stage in that hospital admission. So whilst some of the humanity had been lost by masks and visors and aprons, I think people's cognizance of, of what, it, what people are frightened of, what is important to people, has really been drawn out within the pandemic time. Thank you. Uh, Father Giles, any? Well, I, 
I, I think you know, all, all, all I want to add to that, to the, the idea of what is a, a good death, I think it's, it, it can be various things. I mean, it can be um, a death that is accepted and prepared for. And I, I think when I visit patients who know they're a di know they are dying and are at peace with it and have accepted it, that must be a great blessing both to them and to their family. Um, and I think that very often happens because of the, the care they receive um, from palliative care teams and who, who assist them in, um, you know, in, in that sort of dying well um, and, and, and assist them in accepting. I remember when my, when my own father died, he died at home. Um, my mum and my sister were with him. I'd not, I'd not long left. Um, and we all think that my father had a good death. It, it, it seemed to um, be a peaceful and accepted death. And I think one of the problems we might have um, in, you know, in a time of pandemic is that we, um, is, is that precisely the circumstances of, your, of the death you might have wanted, you don't get, but as Catherine said, it, maybe it's the best death we can, we can manage given the circumstances. Um, but a good death, I mean, overall, I suppose, is, is one that is, um, you know, it, it, ideally, one that is accepted and one that's prepared for. Thank you. We've got lots of lots of questions coming up of, of different kinds. So I'll, I'll take a question, which is I think quite a uh, a short one and a particular one uh, from from Christina Mottram, who brought up a question about the use of iPads um, uh, after death. Um, Christina. Hello. Yes. I mean, Certainly we've seen the value of using iPads for communication and for facilitating sacraments in my chaplaincy. Um, I'm in Leicester hospitals. Um, but we did get a message going through um, saying, please don't use iPads, take photographs of anyone, a patient who had passed away, who had died. Um, but of course that is quite difficult for the people who hadn't had that last chance to see their loved one and sometimes I think even personally I would say just being able to see that a person actually has died and is peaceful no more pain no more discomfort I think that can be healing in some cases so I'd be interested in what people's views were we didn't do it so, so um, being able to see your dead loved ones as dead, um, Father Giles, do you want to start? Um, it's not something that I came across using iPads in that way to actually so that people could see something rather than just a still photo. But I suppose, I mean, if that's um, helpful to the people, um, my instinct is that it's, it, it, in a very sort of limited way, it's, it, it's probably okay. I mean, you, you don't want a voyeurism. There might be, I suppose, um, some legal things around information governance that I know that um, I, I, I've been, I, I've come across people having problems with images being taken of, of the dead and, and that's been quoted. So there may be technical or legal problems with it, but if, if it's helpful for people to see the, uh, the person has actually died and they can see them in a peaceful state, well, perhaps there's some merit in it. Catherine? I'm thinking of a very particular patient as, as this question was asked. I, I looked after many years ago uh, a young dad and he was dying of an advanced cancer and his wife had um, as a young child not been allowed to see her dying father and had not been allowed to see him dead and had not been allowed to attend the funeral and had been reaping the difficulties that that sowed in her life for the rest of her life 
And her concern was that their children who were six and three were too small to understand what was going on. But she wanted to have photographs of their dead dad for when they were old enough to ask questions. Um, and she had very sensible reasons for wanting to do that. And I encouraged her to take those photographs. Months later, uh, on a Saturday morning, I was on call for the hospice and there was um, a card envelope in my pigeonhole. And the rule for the hospice was that we never opened post alone um, because there may be donations in and we needed to have a transparent witness trail for donations. So the, the, I went and found the nearest available member of staff who was our uh, head of housekeeping, absolutely fantastic woman, I said to her, can you just be with me while I open this letter? I don't think there'll be anything in it, but when we opened it, it was a card. She said, oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Who's it from? And I opened it and inside were photographs of a corpse in a coffin surrounded by teddy bears and children's pictures. And I had to make this woman a cup of tea to help her to recover from what she'd seen. But it was actually the thank you letter from this mum to say, the pictures came out lovely, didn't they? I thought you'd like to see them. I have to say my idea of lovely and hers didn't perhaps match so well, but she felt she now had the tools to have those conversations with her children. So I think it's really important that we can individualize that for families. The difficulties with the, the ward iPad are that of course it falls under its hospital property, it's subject to information governance, and it's going to be used by another family after this who might open the photos. So, you know, if we were going to use them, we'd have to have a, a trail of being able to take them transfer them to the family straight away and, and delete them. So there'd need to be some kind of governance for them. But I think as a, as a tool, it's something that some families really, really appreciate. Uh, so we, we have a follow-up question from Anthony Weaver. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, may I ask a clarification from Christina? You use the words, Christina, we didn't do it. And I couldn't grasp whether you meant that you didn't obey the so-called prohibition on photography of the dead person, or whether um, you didn't take the photograph. Which did you mean? It was the, the folk, we weren't, as chaplaincy, we were advised not to do the photos at all. Ad advised so, by whom? By the, uh, I think it was by the intensive care from the hospital authorities. Mm. Mm. So, I, but I, I think I got the impression it was following chaplaincy principles. Right. So. That, I would reject uh, that advice and those principles completely. When my mother died in Bramcote Hospital near Nuneaton, I used my Olympus Mio camera uh, in 2004 to take a, photogra a photograph of her after she died. I treasure those photographs. Um, and I would draw your attention to what I believe. I'm not a medic at all. I teach Spanish. So it's a world I don't belong to. But I understand practice now uh, when a mother gives birth to a stillborn baby, whereas 50 years ago the baby was wrapped in a towel and, um, and quickly taken away, I believe practice now is for the dead baby to be given to the mother if she wants to hold it and for photographs to be taken. I would regard that as excellent practice and I would reject uh, personally the advice, so-called advice, which you were given. What could possibly be the motive? Uh, I mean, Giles has mentioned some rather bizarre possible legal problems, which uh, are so obscure that we can't even uh, put our finger on them. Um, if the relative benefits, why should the photographs be discouraged? even less forbidden. 
Do you, does, does any of the other panel members want to, to pick this up? What is the... I, I don't... I can answer that. Um, each hospital will have um, somebody appointed called a Caldecott guardian, who is responsible for um, transfer of any clinical information between any party other than within the hospital. So it's stronger than advice. Um, it is written into law, as Father Giles suggested, and any staff breaking those rules would be subject to a, dis to a significant disciplinary action. I think the key thing is individualizing it to that patient's situation. And if the advice stroke, the governance rules in Leicester are that photographs shouldn't be taken, there are often ways around that, for instance, of viewing in the chapel of rest, that there can be an organised um, process put in place so that the family can then have um, those photographs if required. Because as Kath said, unfortunately, most we all would love to think that families always have the best motives for things, but sadly, occasionally, things don't always work as smoothly as you might imagine. And photographs can be used outside those usual um, a framework that we would normally expect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do, uh, Catherine or Giles, do you want to come in on that? I think that, um, the, the point that was made about the photography of, of dead newborns, I mean, that, that certainly happens. But that, but the, the the answer to that is what Catherine said, which is that it's um that's done by a photographer who's brought in by the hospital and it's under very strict governance and we know exactly what the trail of the photo what happens to the photographs. We and uh, and as Liz said, with it with an iPad that we're passing around, um, and there aren't so strict um, procedures about then. If things can go wrong, they will. Photos will end up in the wrong hands, and as will videos. And it's it's something we have to be very careful about. Otherwise, people could end up seeing things they didn't want to be seen, or people could have images of their loved one being seen by others when they wouldn't want it to have been. So it's it is the it's the thing about governance um, and the fact that you know things if they can go wrong, they will. And we have to be very careful about um, how we use devices um, so the, the the newborn thing is done very strictly um, and not with iPads and there is a difference. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll turn to another subject because it's been it's gone back and forward quite a lot in 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 the Zoom. There have been a number of comments in relation to to DNA CPR and respect and um, how perceptions of these fit with with uh, um, advanced care planning um, and whether they've been properly used. I mean, there's an overlap between that. Uh, could I invite Mary McHugh to, I mean, there are many people who've, who've, who've mentioned it, but could I invite Mary to, to, to say something about DNA CPR? Yeah, well, one of my questions was about um, how often um, the advanced care planning and DNA CPR has been used in care homes to keep people in care homes and not actually admit them to hospital where they may not have needed or been eligible for ventilation but they would have had rehydration oxygen uh, professional nursing care proning all the things that go with the management uh, in non-invasive management of covid and um, I think there has been times when somebody who has had a DNA CPR form that has been interpreted as not requiring hospital admission or not wanting hospital admission. Um, I just wondered if people had any comments on that. I, I, I'd have a comment on that, Adrian. I mean, we know that GPs were instructed and actually did go into care homes making sure that respect forms were completed. Uh, so absolutely, the nice guidance on going to ITU was administered in care homes, not by people going to ITU. And there is no question that respect forms have simply been have replaced CPR forms in some areas and simply are, you're not going to 
you're not going to have treatment to whatever level. They give you a ceiling of care and they, they perform a lot better for the doctors and the hospitals than the CPR form would do. So yes, respect forms have replaced CPR forms and they're a five minute discussion. They're not an advanced care directive and respect in particular, it can be filled in by a medic and say, I'm going to fill it in and that's that. So respect has replaced CPR forms in a number of places. And as I say, respect forms have been used with, as administering nice guidance for ITU in care homes so that you never leave your care home. Uh, so, I mean, there is nice guidance about, C, uh, about um, uh, critical care once you've entered hospital, and there's nice guidance about primary care and how you enter hospital. There's two, there are two sets of different sets of guidance. But Catherine, did you want to say something about respect? I mean, the, 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 talk about um, resuscitation status and advance uh, decisions about medical treatment. And first of all, I just want to say hello to Mary because it's so lovely to see her again. Hi, Mary. <laughs> this, this is such an important question because most people who live in residential care live in residential care because they are now physically too frail to live unsupported by carers and that therefore if you were if you were using um, a, a scoring algorithm to predict how well that person's increasingly frail physical body would be able to withstand some medical treatments you would find that they wouldn't be well enough for example some people with advanced lung disease wouldn't be well enough to have a general anesthetic and that might mean that if they were to fall over and break a hip, although the best treatment for a hip fracture is to have your hip replaced with orthopaedic surgery, that they might not be able to have that treatment because they wouldn't survive having the general anaesthetic. So I'm trying to take an example that takes us away from life or death decision making, making for a moment to be able to say that if I were that person's general practitioner having a conversation with them in their residential care home, we might need to think about the sorts of things that might happen to you as an individual person. So you are this person with this life experience, with this attitude to medical risk, and with these things now wrong with your body that might cause you problems. So I might need to make a very different set of plans for a person who's got a brain tumour, for example, who might have a series of fits if the pressure in their skull, in their brain, starts to rise. I need a plan for what would happen if you were to have those fits and what would happen if you weren't able to breathe for a period of time during those fits. That would be a different plan from a plan with somebody who's got something wrong with their heart and their circulation, whose medical crises might be different. So having only a decision about cardiopulmonary resuscitation is insufficient. These are nuanced, layered decisions that need to be made about individuals. And I've met people who would rather stay in their place of residence at home or residential care where they know the staff and die there than go into hospital again because hospital was so difficult and so unpleasant for them pre-COVID. And I've met other people whose attitude was, I want to wring every single possible day I can out of living, and I'm prepared to take additional risks and be uncomfortable. I definitely wouldn't want to refuse to go to hospital. And I've chosen those words very quickly. I wouldn't want to refuse. And this is actually, the fulcrum of the decision, isn't it? That none of us has the right to request and insist on a treatment that cannot help us medically. So I take my viral sore throat to my GP and my GP says, that is a viral sore throat, go home and take paracetamols. And I say, but I want antibiotics. And my GP says, antibiotics do not treat viral infection, go away. I, I will not give it to you because it's not an appropriate treatment for you. It won't make you better. So in the same way, if I'm a person who um, can't have a general anaesthetic, then a general anaesthetic 
won't make me better. So I can consent if I'm offered, but I can't demand if it's not going to help me. And I think we've lost sight of that, particularly during COVID, where we've started to think about would this person go to hospital or not? It's actually would this person agree to go to hospital if hospital had treatments to offer that would help? Would this person go to, would this person have a ventilator or not? We never, we never had to ration ventilators during COVID in the UK. They had to in Italy, but we never had to ration ventilators in the UK. The question is, if a, if a ventilator was appropriate for this person, would they agree to it or not? And yeah, I think the question... My, my comment is that many patients who admitted to hospital didn't need ventilation. Many didn't need CPAP. They actually got better with oxygen and proning and physiotherapy and rehydration. Mm. Yet in care homes, none of those things are available because there are no trained nurses in care homes. There is no oxygen. There's no pulse oximetry. So making a decision that this patient is not for ventilation isn't the question. The question is, shouldn't they have had the opportunity where, ne where, where they want it to actually have those non-ventilatory managements that are not available in care homes? That was my question. Okay. Can, I, can I just follow up? Because I think there's, I mean, I've also come across from personal, indirectly personal experience, um, uh, people in, in uh, care homes and, and paramedics being unwilling to take them to hospital because of policies which are related to risk, so that they will be put at risk by, by going to hospital. And that's a slightly different thing from indication, because some people might be willing to take a risk. Um, so there, there is a question, there was, a, uh, I think, a, uh, a seems to have been a policy, at least in some places, of keeping people in care homes away from hospitals as hospitals were becoming more dangerous places. But there were also this range of treatments that might have been available to them. So it's um, not ventilation, but these other kind of range of treatments. And I think that's a concern that people had, not, not the ventilation per se, but the, the question about admission to hospital in the first place. Or some, some districts have put those services into care homes to support the care homes with nursing services and physio, but that hasn't been universal across the no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. People should have had the opportunity to have various treatments which are appropriate for them. But the reality is, working in an acute hospital and seeing some of the background, people have been admitted and they haven't got the appropriate treatment. And the outcome of the COVID crisis will be that we haven't treated people as appropriately. They've had no chance of non-invasive treatments and that's why we've had such a high mortality and that's why the nightingale hospitals were empty because we actually haven't treated people very appropriately we've been very keen to put them on end of life care very quickly indeed especially if you're elderly do you, do you want to say something liz about nightingales can, can i say something um, uh, uh, Adrian, you, you why don't you speak can first and then i'll speak first. after you oh let adrian, adrian have the floor sorry that's very kind I was just going to say, I think that I think that the decisions are a bit more complex and a little bit more nuanced and layered, as as Catherine says. Of course, the decision of whether to admit someone with a broken hip is very different from the decision whether to admit someone with, say, pneumonia or something like that. And with our advanced dementia at home care service that we developed, one of the things that was really very clear was that actually people often died less often staying at home than they did in hospital. And one of the things that we shouldn't do is to equate hospital care with living and care, staying in the care home with dying. And I certainly know one old gentleman who developed the virus in nursing care. And actually, we, it was said, don't send him to hospital. Um, we let him stay where he is. Family could, family could visit if he's, if he's dying. And, and it was very, very clear that if he'd gone to hospital, he would almost certainly not have made it. And in fact, rather wonderfully, he has recovered. So I think that um, there is a balance which we need to get right. And I, suspect, I think what's very clear is if, if people are not allowed in the hospital because the hospital is trying to protect itself and they're excluded from it, we have a real, we have a real concern about that. Although if on balance, 
the decision to stay at the decision to stay at home or to stay in the care home actually gives things which actually are better opportunities, possibly the opportunity of dying well, possibly a greater opportunity of survival, but all sorts of different outcomes. And actually, we should be honest about why we are not admitting to hospital. We certainly shouldn't see all hospital non-admission as bad, and we certainly shouldn't see all hospital admission as good. It's more complicated than that, different outcomes. Thank you, Liz. So Adrian, I thank you for saying what you did because I'd echo an awful lot of, of what you said. And I think we have to remember that actually there isn't a treatment for COVID. Um, it's a viral infection for which we don't, apart from steroids, which we've used for ages, um, which maybe help with some of the symptoms. It's the supportive care whilst the, the person is either able to come through COVID or not. And I absolutely agree with you, Adrian Farrell, that things like hydration, are important actually sitting the patient up getting them walking and moving around those are the things that are helpful and i think that's one of certainly in my own trust a number of the care of the elderly physicians have actually been leading on the covid wards because they are the experts in that holistic view so i think it's maybe a little unfair to say they haven't been getting the treatment they've needed they've been having the supportive care they've needed with regard to your comment on Nightingale, I think um, I've recently been appointed to the Nightingale Hospital in Exeter. Um, fortunately, we, we've taken it over and we haven't actually needed to admit any patients yet. We may need to in future. But I think we need to be clear about the criteria for people going to a Nightingale Hospital. If a patient is going to need intubation, although that's what they were set up to do, most intensivists will wish to treat a patient who needs to be intubated with the entire resources of a big district general hospital around them. So there are very strict criteria for being admitted to Nightingale in terms of only needing effectively one organ support. So if a patient requires dialysis or um, other forms of treatment, then that isn't the right environment for them because they will not get the best care there. Probably in Exeter, I would imagine, um, we won't be using um, Nightingale for many intubated patients. They are more likely to be benefiting from the expanded ITU capacity that is, is being built. But actually, it will be a centre of excellence for all the things that you describe in terms of patients going who aren't well enough to be at home, but actually to have that high level of nursing care, to be well hydrated, to have the physios. There have been huge numbers of physios and OTs recruited to Nightingale to very much help with that um, initial care and also the rehabilitation. So I think if we were looking at designing Nightingale again, again, we might look at it a little bit differently. I think the people that designed the Nightingale Hospital looked at what they were being told from Italy, where they'd run out of ITU capacity, you needed lots and lots of ventilators, but that isn't actually what we're seeing. And we know that people who do need intubation are amongst the very, very sickest and their prognosis is extremely poor. But actually, if we can use BiPAP and high flow oxygen, those are the groups of patients who are more likely to have a positive outcome in terms of getting home from hospital and being able to rehabilitate. I think one area that I use the word rehabilitate, we have got so much to learn about how the impact of COVID is going to go on for years in people's lives. So thank you for very much. I, I'd like to bring in, a, to mix it a little and bring in a question from Mia Hilborn about, about the second wave. Mia. Yeah, hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry, I'm struggling here with my video. Um, what I would want to know is if there is going to be a second wave, do you think there will be or not? Um, what would you do differently? I mean, we've already heard a little bit from Liz with regards to the Nightingales. Um, and um, from my experience of the London one, I would completely agree. It seems an extraordinary waste of resources in all honesty. And we, we always had capacity in London. Um, so therefore every single patient that was at the Nightingale could have been looked after in, in many of our hospitals, just mine alone. Um, so there was so much space. Um, 
and 100 of our staff were taken off there to look after 60 patients in the end. Um, we could have used them. Um, so what, what would all the panellists do differently um, should the second or when the second wave comes? And do you think there will be a second wave, if not a third? Thank, thank you very much. Who wants to go first? Catherine. Shall I go first? Okay. Catherine right, can Liz, go first. No, right? Liz, you volunteer. Okay. Um, so this, in terms of will there be a second wave and a third wave, I think, yes, we almost certainly will see more cases. I'd like to believe that there is some evidence um, coming that maybe the virus is becoming a little less morbid in terms of it doesn't serve the virus well to kill its hosts. And it seems possibly there's some evidence coming out to suggest that actually the mortality is likely to, to be less. In terms of what we would do differently, I think our preparedness will be very different. Um, I think one of the key things is making sure we look after patients who've got COVID, but also very much making sure we don't forget about everybody else who've got life-threatening conditions, whether it be cardiac or um, stroke medicine, et cetera. And there's a lot of work going along look, at the moment looking at hot and cold hubs. There's a lot of work going on in terms of community diagnostic centres um, where we took over a lot of um, private facilities to be able to deliver surgery for patients who um, needed urgent surgery but actually not having them in a high-risk hospital. So I think having a lot of that planning having been done um, will very much help mitigate the problems with overwhelming problems we had. I also think staff are a little, if I say less, patient, all of our staff were worried as well. They all had families, they all had um, people at home and they weren't sure what we were dealing with. We know much more about what PPE is actually required at the moment. So a lot more planning has, all, has gone on and will be going on. So it should be a lot easier. I think we've learned a lot about care of patients as well. I think that initial thought that everybody needed to be ventilated, um, whether invasively or non-invasively, hasn't been shown to be the case. There have been a lot, of a lot of clinical research going on looking at best practice, not just um, drug interventions, but actually about the supportive care. So I think we've learned a lot from that aspect, which will enable us to um, look after people better and communicate risk better. Thank you. Catherine. Thanks, Liz. So glad you went first. <laughs> the, thinking uh, uh, around advanced care planning, coming back to that, I would like to see much more nuanced advanced care planning. And that really comes back to what Mary was asking about and what both the Adrians have uh, talked to as well, which is that actually now that we know that we fell down by seeming to make block decisions, and in fact when you try and trace those down, a lot of them were not block decisions, they were individualised but they were blunt. And actually I think we need to be much more nuanced and much more individualised. Um, there is a case, for example, for thinking about the experience of a person with dementia being taken out of their familiar circumstances to unfamiliar circumstances and be nursed by people wearing PPE and how terrifying that might be. Now, that could be interpreted as don't take people with dementia into hospital. And that isn't what I'm saying, but it's certainly the way the newspapers would report it. So we need to be much more nuanced in having those conversations and making sure that people, and by people, I mean the person whose decisions we're trying to reach, either because they are making the decisions with capacity to make them, or because we're following a best interests process properly in line with the Mental Capacity Act, and their families and their beloveds and the people who are looking after them understand what those decisions are about. Uh, I think, that one of the things that we found is that whilst there was a rush to ventilate which was possibly unnecessary another one of the things that we've discovered is that some people actually will tolerate and survive with prolonged ventilation and i think early on 
we maybe withdrew faster than we now know could have been helpful and that may in part have been about pressure for ventilators it's, it's really hard to know but we certainly know that there are some outliers where people have been ventilated for two three or possibly four months and have subsequently survived with huge rehabilitation needs and that's the other thing about making the decision to ventilate is what the price the person's body will pay for having been so uh, so very sick and for so very long um, so I think we're learning and we're learning all of the time will there be a second wave I think there will be a second wave I think that it will possibly overlie the usual winter pressures we are going to have to redesign the health service to be able to preserve services for people who need them and still be able to respond to COVID and still be able to protect people who are in hospital. And uh, Atul Gawande this week has been talking about uh, the data now coming out in the States of people who've gone into American hospitals for non-COVID related illnesses and have contracted COVID in their hospitals. We really have to find a way to prevent that happening. Thank you. Father Giles. Speaking very much as well, medically as a layman, I, mean, I think it's highly likely there's going to be a second wave, a third pulse, whatever you want to call it, because that's in the, kind of the nature of epidemics. And somebody, somebody described to me, it's a bit like throwing a tennis ball and there's a big bounce and then a smaller bounce and a smaller bounce. And so I think it's highly likely there will be, it will come back, um, maybe in less scale. I'd like us certainly to learn, <clears throat> as has been already been said, I think one of the most important things we need to learn though, is that as in many other crises that have um, faced um, mankind over the centuries, we do learn and we do get better. Um, we, we should have confidence in our ability, even though I said earlier about there's a sort of hubris in humanity about, um, and, and this virus is sort of offended against our culture of omnipotence. I still think we, you know, we do learn um, and we should allow ourselves to learn and we shouldn't kick ourselves too hard that we didn't learn immediately. Um, there are things you can only learn by experience and the important thing is that we do actually learn by the experience and do understand things about the, the, the length people can tolerate ventilation about the fact that the virus seems to have two phases and some people just get the first phase and some people get the second one and that's when it gets nasty. We don't understand it brilliantly. We don't have a treatment for it. But I, I, don't, you know, I, think, I, don't, I don't think we should allow ourselves to be too much rabbits in the headlights of a bus. Um, I, think we should, um, uh, I think we should allow ourselves to learn and not kick ourselves too hard for the lessons we didn't learn as quickly as we might have liked to have done. Thank you. Uh, 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 another question. Um, again, pardon my pronunciation. So, um, uh, which is, uh, in a way, reflects a very good thing that we have a spread of people from from all over the world here. It's w one of the benefits of this medium is is the pooling of of such. Uh, experiences. Uh, Benjamin uh, Olivares Borgeskov um, on um, on living with fear of dying. Thank you. Shall I repeat the questions? Basically, yes, please do. thank you. I'm I'm half I'm half Chilean and half Danish. I'm living currently in Denmark, but I have people in New York, Brazil, and Chile and Madrid, which put me close people everywhere having and what I see in Denmark we haven't been we have been going out very fast of it but there is a lot of people hysteric living in closed doors and and they get a lot of uh, um, they may I will say they in certain way they get marginalized with other people that don't see the problem as as uh, serious. So there is a, an element of people that is having a really rough time, combined with people probably in care homes that some of them that really really want to shut the doors and not want to see anybody, and others don't think that it's so serious. So it's, it's 
a secure situation in Denmark because a lot of people is not considering as serious anymore. So there is this polarization of the, pol the people as well. Some people is really, really having a rough time by being feeling that, um, yeah, partly you could say that having a rough time because they're living in fear and partly because people don't take them seriously. So it's a very strange situation. Thank you. Okay. So who would like to? So I think the question about people living in fear um, who effectively self-isolated, um, I think it comes into two camps. And I think Adrian spoke a little bit about this last week, last um, last um, session. So he may want to, to add more to it. But what we know is that for some people, they know they are high risk and they have managed to adapt their, um, they've made their choice that they would, they don't want to put themselves at risk of catching coronavirus and have made their life maybe a little smaller. But actually, what I hear from that is there's a lot of richness in some of those people. So they may be elderly, they may be a patient on chemotherapy, any patient with lung cancer would fall into that category. But actually, they've spent time um, creating some good experiences whilst, yes, being anxious about um, the possibility of, correct, um, of getting coronavirus. And that would be that, that's evidence-based for instance if somebody is receiving chemotherapy and they get coronavirus their chance of dying from that is higher than the, the general population so i think to criticize people for shielding um, is maybe um, a little bit harsh because it's like any decision um, we make i think the difficulty with people who maybe don't take covid seriously they haven't seen the problems they may know a lot of people who've of their, maybe their own age who've had it and are now antibody positive who've really not had any symptoms. I think that's that's very difficult because it isn't about us as the healthy population. It's about protecting our um, more vulnerable population because this isn't going to go away quickly. And yes, we know there's all the issues about the economy, etc. So I think it's a balance and respecting both both perspectives. Um, but people not going out of their way to um, effectively put the vulnerable at risk. We can never live in a world without risk. Thank you. Catherine? I, I think it's a great question, Benjamin. Thank you. And I think it begs uh, some thinking about how we live together as human beings. And something that's becoming very clear in the United States is um, the choice, the personal choice, the right to make the choice, which is so enshrined in the States, um, includes the choice about whether or not to wear a mask. And the mask wearers feel that the non-mask wearers are being cavalier with everybody else's health. And the non-mask wearers think that the mask wearers are being uh, grandmothering of, of everybody and telling them how they should look after each other, how, how we should look after each other. And I think that we now have an opportunity to think about how, how do we live as a community and how do we enable everybody to feel safe? We can't enable every person to be safe, but we can demonstrate that we have concern and compassion for each other by our behaviours of respecting their fear, can't we? And perhaps that's something that we need to think a little bit more about. Thank you. Father Giles. I think I mean, fear, fear is not rational. So when people are terrified of the consequences of catching this virus, maybe their fears are well founded in their particular case, maybe because in, and they should genuinely be shielding. Sometimes people's fears are not genuinely um, founded and there, there isn't really a particular risk to them. But I think um, we have to be very respectful of of people's fears because they are they, they aren't rational. You can't just explain them away. You can't just convince someone um, not to be afraid. Um, you can perhaps lead them away from their fear over a period of time. But at the moment, we're still perhaps when I mean, we're emerging from the initial kind of um, you know fight of 
of, of, of coronavirus, but we still don't have a great deal of distance from it emotionally in which to help people see things in a slightly different way and to not be so irrationally scared, if in their case it's irrational. But until we know more about this disease, until we have something approaching a genuine treatment for it, as opposed to, um, as Liz said earlier, it's essentially supportive care for those who are going to make it anyway. Um, until we have you know, genuinely objective ways of either more accurately assessing the disease or of treating it, we have to be very respectful of people's fears. We can't just bully them into um, not being afraid. The converse of that, though, is that there are people. There are a lot of people who feel bullied out of their liberty, and and how we resolve that is that that that, that dichotomy. I'm not entirely sure. You know, some people feel bullied out of their liberty, and some people feel bullied out of their safety, because we're still too perhaps too close to be able to be totally rational about. Either, either position. Thank you. And on, on that note, uh, progressively, all things come to an end, uh, and this has come uh, very uh, swiftly. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our three um, uh, panelists, uh, Catherine Mannix, uh, uh, Liz Toy, uh, uh, Father Giles Pinnock, uh, for what for me has been a, a fascinating uh, discussion. I'd like to thank everybody who contributed, everybody who spoke, everybody who didn't get a chance to spoke, but, speak, but uh, particularly those who um, uh, posted things or simply uh, followed things. I think this has been, a, a, for me, a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, event. Thank you again for, for, uh, for, for your participation and, and have a good evening.